With 58 years of independence, at the time of this recording, it seems as though Zambia has made very little progress in its economic development. No one seems to know how Zambia got here though everyone wants to have a say on how the country should be ruled. Join me in this series as I take you on a journey the Zambian economy has already taken in order for you to get a better understanding. The plane burning, do the right thing. The future's in our hands. Oh, let us work together every day. After independence, the ruling party then, ANIP had put forth a program of national development. A program which would last until 1971. This transitional development plan had provided major investments in infrastructure and manufacturing these projects were generally successful. With these reforms we saw Zambia announce its extension to acquire equity holdings. About 51% or more of all foreign-owned firms to be controlled by a parastatal conglomerate which was named the Industry Development Corporation and DECO. By 1970 the Zambian government acquired majority holding in the country including two of the biggest mines, the Anglo-American Corporation and the Rhodesia Selection Trust, which later became Changa Consolidate Copper Mines NCCM and Rhone Consolidate Copper Mines RCM. Going forward Zambia would form more parastatal bodies. Mine Deco was made to govern all mines and Fine Deco was made to allow the Zambian government to gain control over insurance companies, building societies as well as banks. However Barclays, Standard Chartered and Grind Lays Bank successfully resisted a takeover. In 1971 Indeco Mine Deco and Fine Deco were brought together to form Zimco Zambia's Industrial and Mining Corporation. Zimco became one of the largest sub-Saharan companies at the time, with Dr. Kenneth Kaunda as its chairman. Even though the mine names were changed the day-to-day -day operations were still carried out by Anglo-American and RST. In 1993 we would later see the end of this as NCCM and RCM were merged under one firm Zambian Consolidate Copper Mine ZCCM. As this seemed as though it was good news for Zambia it was only the beginning of the bad. Global gas fuel had gone up which was then followed by a slump of copper prices. To sum up in the word of one irate motorist, the first day of the odd even system was a disaster. Gas lines at many stations were a lot longer than normal. The line today is longer than it's ever been. This significantly reduced Zambia's export earnings as copper accounted for 95% of this value. In order to balance up these unusual circumstances Zambia opted to borrow from the IMF. This borrowing continued for a couple of years. And by the mid-80s Zambia was one of the most in-debt countries in the world. In this period Kaunda removed all subsidies from food which saw a rapid and massive increase in foodstuffs. This caused the urban population to begin to protest and with the extreme pressure Kaunda and UNEP broke with the IMF and introduced a new economic recovery plan in 1988. However, this did not help him as people were convinced that the only way to bring change was to change the ruling party. 27 years ago, UNEP promised us a better road to the future. Since then, they have run the country into the ground. The economy has collapsed. We have shortages of food and medicines. Prices have skyrocketed. Transport and education have virtually stopped. Corruption is rife. Don't trust UNEP again. On election day, we can vote for a new government. Vote MMD and set yourself free. MMD, the hour has come. Unlike other African leaders, Kaunda called for multi-party elections which he lost terribly and left office with the inauguration of MMD leader Frederick Chilibo on the 2nd of November 1991. Verdict against him. He polled just 20% of the votes, while the opposition candidate, Frederick Chiluba, of the Movement for Multi-Party Democracy, the MMD, got the rest. 
Chiluba promises to end the nepotism and corruption that characterized the later years of Kaunda's rule and introduce free market policies to revive the crisis-ridden economy. The poll result not only marks the end of Kaunda's supremacy, but also the end of a one-party democracy styled on socialistic lines. The transition to a multi-party system was remarkably peaceful. Poll turnout was extremely high, and by all accounts, the elections were conducted scrupulously. Western observers, including former US President Jimmy Carter, who oversaw the elections, were impressed. Shortly after his landslide victory, Chaluba was sworn in as Zambia's second president and the first democratically elected one in more than two decades. Kaunda acknowledged his defeat with a grace befitting his stature as one of Africa's most respected leaders. He congratulated his successor and said losing was part of the electoral game. This is the nature of multi-party politics. You win some and you lose some elections. Chaluba too accepted his new status with humility. You know, it's, the whole thing is a new ball game to me and I'm waiting for uh, the experts to tell me here is where you start now and uh, uh, your elder brother Kaunda ends there. Then I'll pick it up. But picking up the pieces is not going to be easy. Chaluba will now have to tackle a crippling 12 billion US dollar foreign debt, runaway inflation and a broken down agricultural system. But unlike Kaunda, Chaluba is unlikely to get anywhere near 27 years to keep his poll promises.